Hey everybody, my name is Ben Satterley and I am uh, honored to be a part of this this really cool thing that LP's doing. Um, I've been a fan of LP since the very beginning. Uh, the very first bit of gear I bought with my own money was an LP rock cowbell. So stoked to be a part of this thing. Um, they asked me to do this and uh, they asked me to be the first one. So I am here and hopefully there are a bunch of questions that you guys have for me. I'm coming to you live from my home studio, which is in my basement in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, yeah, so one of the first things I wanted me to discuss was my history with music and drums in, in particular. Um, I was born um, back in the 80s, long time ago, and uh, both my parents were actually drummers. My father was a uh, he played kit and my mother played marching snare back when girls were not supposed to play. And um, yeah, it was one of those things where like I think one of the very first things my mom ever taught me how to do was play like the theme song to Hogan's Heroes on a practice pad, which was which was really cool. And Drums began for me as something I was just drawn to. I couldn't play. I, I sucked. But um, it allowed me to just kind of have like an avenue. So like at church, I would just go straight to the drum kit and just kind of sit there just, you know, just watch it. Like it was it was a lot of fun. Sorry, I'm keeping the mic. Um, and it was something that I was always passionate about, but I didn't really have an avenue for that. I didn't have a drum kit. And then when I was maybe 12 years old, I was able to meet this guy at a barbershop. It's actually a really cool story. He met me at a barbershop. For those of you who don't know, barbershops are like, you know, you go and you hang out all day. He found out I was a drummer. I wasn't really a drummer. I had like a pair of practice sticks and a practice pad, and those sticks were chewed up. But he was like, oh, man, you should play at my church. And I was like, sure, great. Couldn't play a lick. Um, but what he did was he took down my info, and he hit my mom up about like a month later, and he dropped off this drum set. And then we never heard from him again. Uh, it was one of the coolest moments of my life. I cried. And this this drum kit stunk. Like it was not, not just like it stunk as in like it wasn't a nice kit. Like it smelled badly. Like some dude's laundry was actually inside some of the toms. And uh, <laughs> it was a really, uh, it was an amazing experience for me. Because not only did I have a kit that I could play on, but now I could start gigging. So there was a, a bus stop that stopped right like maybe a half a mile from my house and i would wait there for the bus and i'd you know play on like a book or something like that and one day this guy from antigua in the caribbean saw me and uh he said uh oh you play the drums you know thick thick accent um i said yeah and he said all right cool and he, he got my info and the next day he asked my mom if i could possibly come over and jam with him and his family band he played steel drums he's actually a phenomenal steel drum player and I got to go over there and I said, man, I don't really know how to play much of anything. I just, you know, play a couple like funk and pop beats. And he taught me how to play a soca and calypso rhythm. So he's boom, da boom, da boom, da boom, da, you know, um, and then the reggae, like the one drop. And he said, if you can do these three beats, you can play with this band. I said, done. Uh, so the next day he picked me up and we went to Ponca City. So, I, oh, I didn't even tell you all where I'm from. I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, we drove out to Ponca City, which is a very, very small town, to play the Herb Festival. The irony of a steel drum band playing the Herb Festival is not lost on me. I hope it's not lost on you. I thought it was pretty funny. Um, but we went and played for like 40 minutes. I got paid like 30 bucks, and I was hooked. That began my gigging career. Um, I was I was so, so happy to um, make music one. Just that alone was stoked. I, like, I would I would have done it for free, right? But me being able to gig was a game changer because not only was I, I now viewing music as something that I could do professionally, but also I was trying to reinvest. So like I'm in my home studio now surrounded by gear and I don't take that for granted. You know, if I have to pull for a certain snare sound or a certain cymbal, I have that now, which is a blessing. Now I'm 32. I was 12. So this is 20 years ago. Right. So I would start gigging and I would start trying to save up. And my mom, thankful, thankful that she did this. Um, she did a 90 day same as cash with me. I'm not even sure if you can do that anymore uh, because credit is nuts now. But she did a 90 day same as cash with me on a PDP drum kit. I saw it at um, this place called the Jam Shack back in Tulsa. It was the slickest looking kit I ever saw. And I got him to sweeten the deal by throwing in an LP cowbell and a set of brushes. I thought I was like really slick. And uh, yeah, I paid it off with about, three weeks to spare. And I was gigging all summer on that thing. 
So literally from the age of 12 to 20, I played with that steel drum band probably between 20 and 50 times a year, all over Oklahoma, some other parts of like Missouri, Kansas sometimes. And it was always for like rich folks, you know, it was private parties. So like the food was good, you know, so I wasn't, I wasn't hurting for food and I was learning how to gig, you know, so little stuff like being able to reinvest back into yourself, uh, making sure you have enough sticks, making sure your symbols are dope, making sure that you have the right heads, making sure that you have cases. My God, don't buy really nice gear if you can't afford cases. Um, so it was a lot of little stuff like that. And then when I got into middle school at around 13, 14, I was in concert band, right? And I had a little bit late start with music and my middle school band director, Mr. Baird, was so unbelievably kind and giving of his time. And one of the things he did was he allowed me to stay after school, play on the kit, play on the kit during lunchtime. Um, and also he introduced me to this drummer named Dave Weckel. Um, he had a couple of those incredible DVDs. Well, actually they were VHS tapes back then, um, back when he had the mullet and the cherry kit. And uh, it was like, this is how you play this. This is how you count and odd time signatures. And I was just soaking it all up. It was amazing. You got to remember, this is before YouTube, right? This is before really the internet. So if you wanted to search something out, you better go to the library or something or, or ask somebody who's in the know. Um, and that's one of the things that like you younger guys have to your advantage. If I, if I mention Dave Weckl or Vinnie Caliuta or, you know, Steve Jordan or Steve Gadd or one of those guys, you, all you got to do is, you know, Hey Siri, who's Steve Gadd? And then blah, 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 blah. You got all their catalog. You got all their, their, their drum specs. It's amazing. Um, but I kind of wonder sometimes if what that's done is kind of made you guys la like lazy, because for me, I really had to go out of my way to search this stuff out. But anyways, let's get back to that. So between learning from Dave Weckl inadvertently through his videos and Mr. Bear just kind of reinvesting into me, um, I by the time I was in eighth grade, I was doing all city. Um, I had won like most improved in, in band, uh, which is I went from sucking to not sucking as much. But, <laughs> you know, I was uh, I was still very fortunate to get to do that. And when I told him how passionate I was about music and how much he really, you know, made me want to pursue it more, he told me that I needed to go to Booker T. Washington High School. Now, um, Booker T. is what's called a magnet school. So it's it's more not quite like fame, like in New York, but it's it's very much emphasizing the arts, all that stuff. And for me, what I did was I I tried out for the jazz band and I did that all four years and I did marching band for two years. And in jazz band, uh, he told me to take with his friend, Mr. Kirk. Uh, and Mr. Kirk was kind of like Mr. Miyagi as far as the way he taught, because he wouldn't actually like show you. He would just say like a little tidbit. So the way I always like describe him when he like his teaching patterns would be like he would just give you the shovel and tell you where to dig. But like you have to work for it. Right. Um, so in jazz band, I learned about touch. I learned about swing. I learned about dynamics, which is something that a seventh grader doesn't really want to talk about, you know, definitely doesn't want to hear about. Um, so between doing that and then I did marching band for two years. So that got my rudiments up. Um, I got my, uh, stamina up quite a bit because, you know, when I was gigging as a kid, I could only do the Calypso beat for maybe about 30 minutes before I'd have to take a break. And he would just turn on a drum machine and just crank that up to the, the BPM we were at. So I'd go get like a snow cone or something. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it, it was it was a learning process, but I was able to gig, I was able to work, and I was able to save up a little bit of bread to buy more gear, right? Because um, I wasn't saving just to have money. Screw that noise. Um, I wanted the gear. <laughs> but this is also back when, like, Modern Drummer and Drumhead Magazine were, like, 200 pages. And that was back before the quarantine and everyone being out of work. So, um, but getting through high school, uh, I'll fast forward to junior year. I was involved in a pretty gnarly uh, kitchen fire accident. Um, and what happened was, if you can see from here to here, I kind of have like a little bit of a zombie hand. <sighs> um, and that's because I was burned with a, like a really bad grease fire. And I was in the brain unit for a week. I was feeling really bummed and like depressed. And I told my mom um, after my surgery, because I had to get a skin graft. I was like, mom, could you please just bring my, my practice pad and my pair of sticks and, and just... I need to hopefully try to see if I can still play. And when the nurse came in and saw that I was a drummer, she's like, you're a drummer. I said, yeah, you know, I was, and she says, no, 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 that's perfect. That's perfect. Here's what you do. Just go home and promise me that you're going to practice every day as much as you can. And you want to do physical therapy. And, uh, 
So that's what I did. So my mom couldn't complain because I said, mom, doctor's orders, I got to go play. Um, and what that did was it reinstilled in me that that drive and that fire that I want to do this, that this is what I dreamt about since I was 12 years old. Um, and so when I got back to school, I said, well, I can't do marching band anymore because direct sunlight on a burn, can't do it, right? But what I did do is double down on the drum kit. So they got me this really cool compression glove and I, I kind of look slick you know, with it. And I, I realized I couldn't play traditional grip anymore. So no marching, but I still could work on my dynamics. I couldn't hit very hard because I still had to build up the, the, the agility, right? Um, and so what that allowed me to do is double down on the drum kit. And so when that became my focus at around the age of 17, like where it was just drum kit, whoo, I was, I was ready to go. Um, and after high school, I was planning on going to college, uh, and I actually got accepted to Berkeley in Boston. I went down to, um, audition and the great jazz drummer, Ralph Peterson was the guy who was, um, I guess he was the teacher on call that day in, in Dallas. And I was super, super nervous. Now, if y'all don't know who Ralph Peterson is, he's a monster jazz player, but he also plays like piano and like cornet. And so he, he knows his crap. I was just a drummer. And uh, so I go and do my audition and I think I, I kill it. And he's like, all right, cool. Now play me these rudimental patterns. And he, he showed me like this freaking chicken scratch. Right. And I'm like, I think that's a roll. I think that's a roll. You know, like it was, it was just like that. Then on top of that, he was like, all right, now play me like a, a flat fifth on the piano or, and I'm like, I play drums. He's like, yeah, but you got to know all this other stuff too. So I said accepted, but I'm sure I didn't get a full ride. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then about a month before I was supposed to go to college, I just had this like check in my heart and I, I just felt like I wasn't supposed to go. I felt like mentally I was not ready. I was 18 guys. I mean, you know, going across country to live in a massive city like Boston, you, you just, you know, there's certain things that you just, you get, you just get a, you know, a check in your heart about it and you're like, okay, this is probably not a good idea. And I'm honestly very thankful I didn't go because what I did instead was at 18, I was living on my own. My mom moved to Texas and I was trying to gig as much as possible while still working a full-time job. I did not have a car, so I had to accept the gig and then spring it on him that I didn't have a car. Um, so gigging full-time when you don't have a, a, a car and not in like a, a place like LA or New York, because this is before Uber, this is before Lyft. So you just had to bum a ride. Uh, but I was gigging full time. I said, well, if I'm not going to get to go to Berkeley, I'm going to throw myself in the deepest water I can possibly find. So I was taking gigs with the American theater company. I was doing, um, uh, top 40 rock gigs, top 40 funk gigs. Um, and for those of you who know anything about Tulsa music, uh, there's a, a very famous band called the gap band that came out in like the late seventies. And they had this, uh, pickup lick that ended up becoming like the groove for like all that genre. And it was brack -um, brack -um, brack -um, brack bass, snare, bass, snare. And that was it. And I, I would play that till I couldn't even feel my left arm anymore because it hurt so much. Um, so going from that to doing like a casual jazz gig where I'm playing, you know, ride cymbal, kick, snare, hi-hat. And like the kick is actually a floor tom because I don't have two kicks. Um, and I'd be playing for like a steak dinner and like 50 bucks, right? And then I might go play with the American Theater Company in the pit doing something like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. So I was working on my reading chops. I was working on my chops chops just because I – learned early on that the only way to really like make any kind of like solid bread in this industry is to either be really good at one thing or really good at a lot of things. So if you got this one thing that you just kill at, it's great. It's, it's awesome. Um, but not many of us have the luxury of only being a rock drummer or only being a funk drummer because now you got to be able to genre hop, you know, and that wasn't a super common thing to hear back in the cut. Um, I read an article with this drummer named Poogee Bell who played with Marcus Miller. He played with Erica Badu. He's done a lot of stuff with his own band. He's a killer drummer, real pocket oriented. Uh, and in this article, he talked about, you know, if you really want to make any kind of like solid money, you have to be able to say yes to the rock gigs and the funk gigs and the jazz gigs and really like know your crap. So don't be like faking it, like really do your research. And so what that made me want to do is like, I'm mixed, right? My mom's a redhead. My father's black and native American. So, Coming up, it, I was listening to like the Christian music thing, but also like Beatles and like my mom was into like ACDC, but also Rush, but also like Petra and Sandy Patty and stuff. So like I had a huge, you know, splattering of music coming at me. 
And so when I got a little bit older, I realized, okay, well, it's not just one guy playing that. You know, I never even thought, like, who's playing drums on the radio? That didn't dawn on me. And then I thought, well, I wonder if it's ever, like, the same guy on two different types of music. So is the country guy also playing the rock thing? And then I discovered, you know, guys like um, Josh Fries and Sean Pelton and Eddie Bears and Paul Lime. And then, of course, Jeff Bercaro and Kurt Biscara and Abe Jr. and J.R. Robinson, Carlos Vega. I started going down the rabbit hole of journeyman drummers that maybe they had like one genre they did, but they did all of that genre. So, for example, like J.R. Robinson. Of course, everybody knows he's played with Mike Michael Jackson. He's played with Quincy Jones. He's played with, uh, I mean, just you name it. The great Jeff Bercaro played with Michael Jackson. He played with Toto. He played with Sonny and Cher. I realized I wanted to be one of those guys. So getting hip to guys like Kurt Biscara, who started on one gig and then kind of transitioned from the live thing to doing a lot of the session work stuff. Like, I dug that. And then, of course, when I discovered Abe Jr., uh, Abe Laboreal Jr., for those who don't know, if you don't know, now you do. He's, he's, he's one of my favorite drummers. Um, guys like Steve Jordan, who carried their sound throughout, right? Because the thing is, it's like, it's not just um, being able to hit a snare really hard. Sometimes a touch is needed where, like, maybe you can just do brushes, right? So it's one of those things that I always wanted to be able to, from that day forward, be able to, be able to uh, genre hop, right? So play a funk gig and like lay it the frick down, right? Play a hard hitting rock gig and make it sound like, you know, I, I grew up in the nineties as opposed to being like a kid in the nineties. Right. Um, Cause also I didn't grow up during grunge. Like when that was happening, I was not allowed to listen to it. So when I discovered bands like Nirvana and Soundgarden later in life, I was like, this is amazing. And then of course, not just that, but, I wanted to be able to accept other genres as well that were a little bit outside what you would consider uh, normal for a guy like me. I was doing singer-songwriter gigs. I was doing country gigs. And I got really into country for like five or six years. Um, and that's the bulk of the touring that I've done since moving to Nashville. Um, so anyway, so when I graduated high school, I was doing all those types of gigs, right? And I realized that I couldn't just gig if there was any chance at all that I could start teaching as well. I wanted to do that. So I started teaching children, right? Um, normally, they were about 7 to 12 or 13. Um, oh, by the way, guys, if you guys have any questions, freaking hit me up. Like, let me know because I, I want to be able to have, like, a give and take with you guys. So if there's any questions at all, um, my gal Jules is going to let me know. But um, I'll just keep talking. And if you guys have any questions, please let me know. But, um, yeah, one of the things that I did when I started teaching was I realized I had to double down on the basics, right? Because when you're a teacher, it's not only about the really crazy fast chops and stuff. I'm teaching kids at the time on how to be musicians. Musicians aren't worried about chops. They're worried about playing the song, right? So when I started teaching these guys and girls, I was having to go back to the basics. And I really thought it was going to be like beneath me, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and then I realized like, this is not only super insanely difficult to do because now I'm having to dissect every freaking note I'm doing, every phrase, every pattern and dumb it down. Well, I don't want to say dumb it down, but I have to make it in a way where even like the, the simplest of minds can understand it. Right. So I did that for about two or three years and I got I built up. um about 15 or 20 students all around the Tulsa area. I was driving because I had three in Broken Arrow. I had three out in like the Glenpool area. I had five or six in Tulsa. I had a couple in Owasso. I had one whose parents paid me double to drive like 40 minutes to him. Um, and I was, I was hustling. I really thought I had like made it right. Um, and then one of the things that kind of changed is I, I felt like there was a transition, like there was like a new season blowing. And um, for me, what I did was I, I can I talk with my wife? I'm married at this point. I'm married, but no kids. We have a dog. Um, and I said, you know, what do you think about possibly moving somewhere else? And I have, I have friends and family in LA. I have friends in New York. I have friends in Atlanta. I have friends up in Chicago. And I was just kind of looking at all these different places going like, where are some places that I might fit in? Because I felt like I had hit my limit in, uh, in Tulsa, like what I was capable of doing. Right. And for the, oh, my cable came undone. One second. Perfect. There we go. Um, and so for me, you know, I, I was kind of looking at Nashville 
LA, to be perfectly honest with you, scares the crap out of me. And New York, we just couldn't afford it. Like my 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 skin's not thick enough to live on the coast. I prefer it. It's a lot mellower, right? Um, and so we 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 came out and visited a buddy of mine, Noah, who was uh who was and is a killer guitar player. We stayed with him and his wife and their family for a week, and we we realized we love Nashville because it feels it feels. I mean, it is the South, and Oklahoma isn't technically the South, but very same vibes, you know, same kind of accents, same kind of food. And it felt, even though it was a much bigger city and there's a lot more happening, that it was a much slower pace, which is fantastic. So it's not hustle and bustle like the same way L.A. or New York might be. So we decided to move. I gave all the bands I was playing with uh, two months notice, which was a. Uh, I thought it was enough time for them to get somebody else. And we made the move. You know, my wife is a phenomenal singer and uh, she, she hasn't really pursued it the same way I have, but um, I'm trying to get her back into it. But when we moved to Nashville, it was, uh, it was a wake up call. It was a lot more expensive to live here. Right. Uh, on top of that, it's not just expensive. It's very difficult to make a name for yourself um, the right way. And what I mean by that is there's so many people that come out here and think they have to go about, starting their journey in Nashville by like making a big splash. Um, and I've not necessarily found that to be true across the board. You, you ask a hundred people what they've done in Nashville and a hundred people will give you a hundred different stories. Right. So for me, I think I was here about two weeks before I got my first gig and it was with an artist uh, playing downtown on Broadway. For those of you who don't know what Broadway is, it's not the New York Broadway, it's the, the Nashville Broadway. So New York is all the Broadway shows, Bright Lights, Madison Square Garden, or not Madison Square Garden, uh, Times Square. Uh, our Broadway is a bunch of honky-tonks spread out over like a half a mile. Um, and so I played a gig, didn't know any of the songs, didn't know the tempos. It was terrible. I think I made 20 bucks. But I got free soda, so there you go. <laughs> but I was hooked because I realized, okay, like, it's different. So here, rather than having to know a huge uh, variety of genres, you have to know a huge variety of songs. Because in Nashville, it's all about the song. You probably aren't going to get asked to play samba here, right? And so for me, who used to do sambas all the time, I was like, all right, well, maybe put that, uh, maybe put that third cowbell back in the, uh, the bag and just kind of go straight with the kickstand hi-hat symbol, you know. Um, but it allowed me a lot of really great opportunities. And um, I was very fortunate. They say Nashville's a five-year town before anything really, like, substantial happens uh be that like a bus gig or whatnot i was able to get on a bus gig in about two months i was working part-time at guitar center and i got a call from a buddy of mine saying hey i referred you for this gig the band leader's about to call you and uh, i didn't know the gig i didn't know any of the music but when he called me he said oh hey my friend tells me you're familiar with the artist i was not uh he says you know the songs i did not uh but he said uh, would you be willing to do a run of shows this weekend? I said, absolutely. Now I was booked um, Friday at work. I was going to be off Thursday, um, but I had to work Friday. Uh, and so what I did was I kind of said a little bit of a fib and I said, I got sick. And what I did was I went home, excuse me. I had to finish vacuuming like the drum area and uh, yeah, finished vacuuming the drum area. And I went home, kissed my wife, told her what had happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jump up and down load up my gear, and I had about two hours from the time I got home to meet them at bus call. So for those of you who don't know what bus call is, I, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, like offend anybody if you know these terms, but I'm sure there's some people listening who don't know what bus call is. It's basically um, where you go to meet the bus before you guys leave to go out of town. Um, but the bus call for me was about 20 minutes south of where we lived at the time. And so I loaded up my gear, and I go to the bus um, that's in a Kroger, and I meet the band. I meet the artist for the very first time. I don't know anybody and uh, it was an amazing experience that lasted about four or five months and i got to go all over the country i got to play some really fun shows i got to do some fly dates which are great and uh it it built up my confidence as a professional player not just in oklahoma but just a professional player anywhere i i knew that i could now really like stand up and do the gig so moving forward from that i've done several touring situations um like i said mostly in the country slash singer songwriter genre and uh Every gig I've been on has taught me a lot about what it means to be a player, right? And for me, one of the biggest lessons I learned about being in Nashville is that there's not one way to get anywhere you want. And it's okay to change your views of things. The more I toured, the more I realized I like this aspect of it, but not like that. So like, I hate being gone from my family. I never enjoyed that. Even when it was just my wife and I, I missed her. Um, 
And then when we started having kids, um, I it was it was the worst uh, having to go to bus call and, and like waving goodbye to my boy. Now we have two boys, which is cool. One's uh, five and one is going to be two in December. And when my wife finally told me she was pregnant with our second boy, uh, I realized it's time for me to get off the road. Um, because one of the things I realized while on the road is that I love people. I love getting to meet people. But um, one of the things that I hated was being gone and also not feeling like I'm connected to the town. When we moved to Nashville, I kept telling people I want to be a Nashville guy. I don't want to be just like based in Nashville and I'm never there. I want to be in Nashville. Uh, many of you guys who have reached out to me on Instagram uh, have have asked to like meet up for coffee or to have a lesson. And I love being able to say yes to that kind of stuff. You know, I love being able to say, hey, are you going to be in town next week? Yep, not going anywhere. I love that. Um, I love being a part of this city. I love being a part of this community. Um, I feel like it's an amazing place to grow as a person, both, you know, in your private life and professionally. Most of the live music that's happening right now, as far as like, you know, the live records that are that are being cut are happening in Nashville. A lot of the L.A. studios are closing down. Um, there's a huge influx of home studios in Nashville which is fantastic. I mean, you know, granted, like you don't want to see the bigger studios go under, but unfortunately with budgets being cut across the board, even before Corona, um, a lot of those home studios were just getting, you know, closed down, which is unfortunate. So now just about anybody with a MacBook, a couple monitors and a drum kit can now be a studio drummer. Um, and it's not, it's not anything wrong with that. I mean, it's still, if you suck, you aren't going to get work, but if you're able to get the job done and make it sound great, then there you go. Hey, Jules, how am I for time? Are we, are we good? Do we have any questions or anything like that? Sorry. My producer Jules over here is um, helping guide me through everything. And, and okay, we're good. We're good. She says we're good, everybody. Um, but uh, when I decided to step off the road, I'd been touring full time for the better part of seven years since moving to Nashville. Um, I was thankfully able to be home a good portion of the time for my oldest son. Um for like the first like four or five months of his life. And then I started going back out after that. But um, for me, when I really, when I really re realized that I wanted to invest more in people than the road was a few years back. And I'll, I want to explain that story because it's actually a pretty deep story. So at the time I was um, kind of just trying to figure some stuff out for myself. Uh, I had been through some high highs and some low lows at that time. When my oldest son was about to be born, I was on the road with this guy named Christian Bush from Sugarland. He's the guy. He 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 was a was and is a phenomenally nice guy uh and a phenomenal songwriter and I had the pleasure of getting to play percussion and sing background for him for like 3 or 4 months. And uh he that gig ended because he was going back I got with his full band and I literally had to street perform in order to pay rent for my wife and I and our unborn baby for probably about 2 months. Um I I was kind of just, you know, sitting on the couch with my wife and, you know, on the verge of tears, trying to figure it out what we could possibly do. And, uh, I literally just was like, well, I, I guess I could street perform, you know? Um, I think I had an extra set of hi hats and, uh, I posted them on Craigslist and, uh, I said, well, we need groceries and we need rent money. So let's go. I said, she said, where are you going? I said, we just we gotta go somewhere real quick. Meet somebody, go up to the Walgreens. He pulls up, we go do the deal. <laughs> I bring out like my high hat stand, set of sticks. I go, all right, check this out. Brrrah. He's like, all right, cool. Pays me like. I didn't do that. What the frick? Okay. Um, hello. Um, and uh, he hands me like 150 bucks, and I go put it in my wife's hands. Like, Let's go get groceries. Uh, and that, <laughs> in essence, is what you have to do sometimes, right? I mean, nobody wants to sell their gear, especially if it's all you have. I mean, don't do that. But. I had to figure out how to get us through on like a very shoestring budget. Another thing I did was, well, I said I could either go and apply for jobs or I could go and street perform. So that's exactly what I did. I set up a, a Kicksner hi-hat um, and I was jamming along to my wife's dance cardio Pandora station in my headphones. Uh, and I did that for maybe like a month and a half. Uh, and there were days where I was wearing sunglasses because I had tears in my eyes because I'm, I'm going, my God, like, how am I? How am I going to do this? Like, am I, am I making the right choice with, with this? Cause I mean, for those of you out there who have chosen to not have kids, like, yo, it's, it's a lot easier, believe me. Um, but for me, I, I realized like I am passionate about music and I love doing this, but during that time, I, I realized like I'm, I'm willing to go and do whatever is necessary. So whether it be street performing or working at Whole Foods market, 
as a fishmonger, which I also did, coming home stinking like fish, um, you you make do. I mean, I, I here's another funny story. Um, I once got to play. I've played at the Opry, the Grand Ole Opry, uh, like half a dozen times. There was one time in particular where I played right before the end. Said thank you, good night to the the artist I was playing with, and when drove around and picked up somebody from the show I just played as a Lyft driver. So it's definitely uh, a humbling experience being a musician here in Nashville because gigs come and go, and sometimes there are situations that you find yourself in that are super unpleasant, that are not uh, Instagram worthy, right? And that's okay because we're all struggling to figure out who we are as people. Um, be it as a single person, as a husband, as a wife, uh, you just, you just don't know. Um, but there's been several, in, you know, uh, instances where I really had to say, okay, now this is rock bottom. Nope. And the floor opens up and now this is rock bottom. And, uh, I, I always say it's like, it's a great humbling experience because a lot of people throw out that term like humble, but this town, honestly, not just this town, this industry is going to do two things to you. It's either going to humble you into realizing like you're not that great, or it's going to humble you into realizing that you need to quit. Um, thankfully, it did the first one for me, and I realized all like the bull crap, all the unnecessary pride just that, get, that gets built up because uh, we get hurt, or we get angry, or we get jealous, or we get you know taken advantage of. I mean, there's insert a thousand reasons why something cannot go your way, right? And uh, for me, it was an amazing experience to realize that above all, I'm not just a musician. I'm not just a drummer. I'm a, I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a son. I'm a friend. And that was a really, really hard fought life lesson for me. Um, and there are musicians that I still really, really look up to right now who have have instilled in me like core values beyond just like make that money, kill it you know, really cool, po you know, photos and stuff like, like that, that crap does not matter at the end of the day. Cause in reality, like this Instagram thing, Instagram could go away. The internet could go out for some reason, you know? And then it's like all those people that are famous on Instagram, they got nothing. Does your value end with that? Right. I mean, look at this prime example. Look at what this freaking pandemic has done for the music industry. I'm not just talking about like everybody else. I'm just talking just for my industry, for our industry, right? I don't know anybody save uh, a, a few of my homies that are like have TV gigs that are making any kind of like real solid bread. You know, most of the people are on shoestring budgets before this thing happened. So now all of a sudden you're having to go, uh, do I need that third snare drum? Uh, Cause you know, my daughter needs shoes or we need groceries. So uh, maybe I'll go do that gig that uh, I got to wear a freaking mask for, for four hours. You know, nobody's touring. Um, shoot. You know, uh, several of my, my reps haven't even been into their, their offices in months. You know, I mean, half, half the businesses in California aren't even able to go to work right now. Um, it's, it's just, it's a weird time for us. And it, it takes a, a positive outlook of believing that like at the end of the day, like it's going to be okay that this is not forever that like, there is going to be like a light at the end of the tunnel and it's just going to take perseverance. Right. Um, trying to think of anything else I want to talk about. I mean, I, I'd, I'd love to hear some questions, Jules, if you, if there, if there are any, um, Oh, Paul, thank you so much, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about, Oh, okay. Always oh, yeah, yeah, rock on another. Yeah, dude, me too. Me too, brother. Um, uh, Ryan, thank you very much. Thank you. But if you guys have any questions for me, please, you know, keep them coming. I, I, uh, me and Jules actually talked about me. <laughs> Jordan, what's up, brother? That's my homie right there. Uh, <laughs> um, many of you have uh, messaged me about what gear I'm using and, and why I use what gear I'm using. And one of the things that I always like discussing isn't just the why, but like where this stuff came from. Now, um, there are several people um i can't say who they are but there are some amazing names that jules has shared with me they're going to be on this as time goes like next week is a phenomenal percussionist but i'm not going to ruin it um but he's going to be talking about a percussion instrument i chose the drum set like all the drum set right now when i was coming up one of the things that i discovered when i really just first got into the internet um was i wanted to know why we have what we have like for example like if i'm playing 
like a, a one-handed triangle. This is the new thing. Like, that's dope. The triangle's been around for at least, you know, a hundred years in its modern form. But before that, it was played in Africa with like a little piece of iron on top of a junjun. So what's a junjun? Well, it's like a bass drum, but it's on its side, but it's got like a hide. You know, it's, it, it's, I always wanted to know like why stuff became what it became. We have tom toms. Where did those come from? Originally, they were called Chinese tom toms, and they had a head like with like nails tacked on. Um, the drum set. Why do we call it a set? It used to be called a trap set. Why is it called that? Um, so they called it a trap set because it had different what they called traps in it. So they might have like a cowbell, uh, like that. <laughs> so they might have something like this, right? But it was much smaller. But music was also a way different back then too. I mean, there was no uh, like top 40 radio hits like we have it now. It was, you know, ragtime and stuff like that. So drummers were basically just having to fit in where they could. Um, back in the day before drum sets and the advent of like the modern drum pedal, you had guys playing bass drum with one, with, you know, with a mallet. And then another guy playing snare with sticks. And there was no snare stands. It was on like a snare. Uh, it was on a, a chair angled to the side, right? Um, and it's like what the, the, all these modern inventions, like the hi-hat stand started as something called the low boy. And it was only about that far off the ground. And all you could do was up and down. You didn't hit it with the, your, your stick. Um, and then they started realizing, well, if I add this, if I add, okay, this, this kind of timpani tom is what we're going to call it. And then we're just called a tom. And then what if we add a, a, like another head to the bottom and we could tune them up? Okay. Well, what do we have? We have calfskin heads, little stuff like that. It's just like, we take so much of this stuff for granted because even like, sort of crappy instruments now are still heads and tails like way better than freaking what they were using 80 years ago maybe not necessarily like in the craftsmanship but in like in the the longevity like this stuff lasts a lot more um not to say the gear back then wasn't amazing it was and it definitely has its thing but like i couldn't play a calfskin head drum kit on like a hard-hitting rock gig just couldn't do it um those heads are super temperamental so like when Mylar heads came along. I believe Evans was the first one to do it. And then Remo was the biggest one. And then, of course, Aquarian came on later. Attack came on later. Um, but, like, that was a game changer because it allowed you to be able to play not just in hot situations but in cold situations where um, the they weren't so temperamental. The, the moisture from the air wasn't jacking with the tuning, right? Symbols. I mean, my gosh. Like, I have – here, I'll, I'll show you some of my symbols. For example, something like this, this was, like, not seen – even like 25 years ago, you didn't see partial lathing. So like little stuff like that, that we take for granted is all relatively new compared to what it was. You know, you go back 60 years or 70 years, there was only one symbol company. It was Zildjian. That was it. They, that was it. Then you had another joint and then another joint. Um, drum wise, you know, uh, drum sets back in the day were very, very lightweight. They weren't super heavy duty. Or if they were, they were like twice as expensive. Um, heads could be super out of round. Shells could be super out of round. And so it was not consistent at all with what you were playing on. I mean, sometimes you would get a kit that sounds freaking amazing. Other times you get a kit that sounds like butt, right? Or maybe just the rack tom sayings and the, like the floor tom sounds like dog crap. And what it did was it caused people to constantly have to innovate. So you had guys like uh, Billy Gladstone, who was an innovator in early like drum design, right? George Way, the great George Way. Um, and then you had companies also making sticks. There was no Vader or Vic Firth back then. It was all the sticks you saw were usually made by a company like, say, Ludwig or Slingerland or Vox. Um, and so signature sticks were, were people that were just endorsing those sticks at the time. Um, of course, not just the gear, but like the players were super influential in who was buying the products, right? So guys like, say, Buddy Rich sold so many drum kits. And then Ringo, 1964, Ed Sullivan, forget about it. I heard that Ludwig Drums back in the day when like after the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan had to do like 24 hours around the clock uh, manufacturing to be able to meet the demand. So what the demand meant was that they were shelling them out quicker. So they weren't necessarily as consistent, right? But also during this time, let's say from the 40s to the 50s, we're now dealing with 
amplified music for the first time. Before that, you might hear a microphone, but now we're hearing amps, like guitar amps, like you're plugging into a guitar amp. Drums still weren't mic'd yet, um, so you had to play loud or soft depending on the group you're playing with. Um, also, if you guys have any more questions, keep them coming, Jules. I don't know if they're asking any more, <laughs> so just keep them coming because I will talk. <laughs> um, but when you get into the 50s and 60s, all of a sudden, people are hitting harder. Sticks are getting bigger. Symbols are getting thicker, right? Um, and one of the things that I saw was, for example, like um, you guys can't see, but I have uh, just kick snare hi-hat set up right now because I'm working on a loops thing I'm doing. But rack toms, just like one rack tom, drums were not big back then. Um, Louis Belson invented the double pedal, or not double pedal, the double bass drum setup back in, I want to say the late 30s, early 40s. That was, he was the first guy to do two drums at one time. So game changer. So all you metal guys out there listening that aren't uh, super hip to who Louis Belson is, bow down, because that dude is the reason why you have double pedal. So there'd be no Meshuggah, there'd be no Slayer, there'd be no Judas Priest, there'd be none of those bands without Louis Belson doing his thing back with uh, Duke Ellington. So check out Skin Deep. He, the, the solo is he's just doing 16th notes. It was a showstopper, right? Um, and that was 80 years ago, you guys. Like that's that's crazy that we've come that far. So when you get into the 50s and 60s, now all of a sudden hardware is getting better. They're starting to allow symbols to slant, right? Uh, so like the the uh, the post, I'll show you. This post right here, there was no, there was no uh, boom symbol stands back then. So something that like old jazzers would do was actually take a freaking, I can't believe they would do this. They would take a file and literally file down the center hole of the symbol so it would rest at an angle. Now we call that keyholing, but they'd actually do that on purpose back then. So all of a sudden you're hitting harder. Drum heads have to last longer. Mylar comes in. So you now you got, you know, uh, Evans was the, the, the innovators of, the drum head as far as like using mylar right and then of course you know remo belly aquarian attack all those other brands that have come afterwards but like that that was a game changer um then on top of that you had higher tensions so the lugs had to be better right uh you had to deal with uh now you're miking the drums now you're hitting harder so let's try bigger drums now now bigger drums had become kind of a thing of the past for Honestly, about 20 years um, in the 50s and 60s, you didn't really see big drum sets, not just large um, like amounts of drums, but also in size. When the bebop thing hit in the 40s and the 50s, you're seeing a lot of 18 inch bass drums, a lot of 20 inch kicks. So then all of a sudden when rock starts becoming a thing again, we're, we're, we're bouncing back up the diameter, right? The tensions are higher, so you're needing to cut more Then you're seeing microphones, not like everything's top and bottom mic, like a microphone. You know, all those great Stax records, uh, the Motown stuff, in the, when they were recording uh, in the Snake Pit for Motown. It was like, I think, four or five mics for the entire band. Um, it, it was, I, I, I love, I love talking about stuff like that. I love learning about stuff like that because it's so important. Now we take, we take mics for granted. Like um, on this, on this pack that I'm doing, I'm not even sure if you guys can see this, but yeah, it's, it's a really, really small kit. I'm using overhead room snare and two kicks, right? That is more than like half a Beatles record. Okay. Cause for the Beatles, they use like, I think two mics for a good portion of those songs you were hearing for um, the drums. So when you think that like some of the greatest drum sounds, some of the greatest records ever freaking heard were, were done with 16 channels total. When my home studio has 16 channels available just for drums, that's bonkers. Jules, you said there was a question about symbols. Yeah, let her rip. Let her rip. Why would some cats play with smaller symbols? Okay, so that's a great question. So back in the day, all symbols were small. Um, it wasn't until guys like um, Chick Webb, Gene Krupa were asking for bigger diameter and thicker symbols. Because back then, all symbols basically sounded like splashes, right? It was just versions of a splash. So like a hi-hat was like a 10-inch or 11-inch symbol. So it was, you know, so it's basically like hitting a splash symbol. Even the rides they had, like the rides, because uh, back then they were just called symbols. It wasn't until the, the, the I believe it was Avidus Zildjian who started naming the symbols, the different names. He came up with hi-hat, he came up with splash, he came up with swish, he came up with ride, um, crash. All those are, he can't patent the name, but he's the guy that named them. Um, they were needing to cut more 
they were needing for stuff to last more and they were needed to have a fuller, richer sound. So back in the day, it was all smaller symbols. And it wasn't until honestly, relatively recently where big symbols became a thing again, because back in like the seventies, it was thicker, but it wasn't necessarily bigger. You would have a 20 inch ride or a 22 inch ride, smaller crashes, but they were a lot thicker. Now you have really, really big crashes that are really thin. So, but yeah, great question. Um, but yeah, keep them coming, Jules. Hit them. Um, but yeah, like, okay. Uh, what shakers are you using? Love LP tambourines and cowbells. Want to check out some LP shakers for the studio? Oh, good question, brother. Okay. Um, so I literally have some shakers right here. You want to see them? So I have LP studio large, LP studio small. Um, the soft twist shaker. Oh, gosh. The maracas. Uh, uh, these are really cool. I'm not nearly as good as like one of those guys from, I believe it's Peru. They have like their own style of Maraca playing that is mm, so sick. Uh, oh my gosh. I have, I have so many guys. One second. Ugh. These are really cool too. Um, these are great on the hi-hats. I broke that one. So I got a replacement. Um, but yeah, dude, I, I freaking, I love shakers. They're so much fun. And like, Another thing is like when you're doing home studio stuff, you got to be able to not only just play the kit, but also add percussion. So uh, for example, I was doing a session like yesterday. I had a couple models that I was using. Um, I had this tambo as an option. This is the, the jingle stick from LP. Um, I have this 70 year old uh, Ludwig and Ludwig tambourine. Can you see the logo? Look at that. That is really cool. My mom actually gave this to me. This belonged to her as a kid. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, that's another thing that like, that was a relatively new thing because back in the day, you're very welcome, Brian. You're very welcome, brother. Um, back in the day, percussionists were really, I mean, they were, uh, most bands had a percussionist um, on like, on like a bigger scale. Um, and they've kind of gone the way of uh, the dinosaur recently, which is really unfortunate. You know, I have some very close friends and mentors who are amazing percussionists and they're only able to really do larger level gigs because a lot of the lower budget gigs cannot afford a percussionist anymore. Same way with like background singers. Like you don't see that very much anymore. So now not only do you have to be able to play kit, but you have to be able to engineer yourself. You have to be able to run, uh, you know, an interface. So at least eight channels, at least to, to have a home studio, then you have to be able to do, you know, uh, overdubs. So for example, like, you know, if I play like a kick snare pattern or something like that here, I'll just show you. I'll watch my volume. Um, if I'm doing like a, a, a kick snare pattern, I'm gonna have to clean this up afterwards, by the way. Thank you guys for making me make a mess. So if I'm doing, you know, something like this, just, you know, holding down the screw, I could have a couple options of what I could lay over that, right? So I might do something like this. So boom, boom, da, 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 da. something like solid 16th notes. And then I might add maybe like a clave block or something like that. And just kind of see um, what the music is speaking to me about, you know, like, because you obviously like you, one of the things that I always tell all my students is I don't want you to be just a drummer. I want you to be a musician because drummers only think about drums. Musicians think about everything that's happening. Right. So uh, for me, I recently uh, doubled down again on like the, the live, the, excuse me, the, like the in-person lessons because almost all of my students were in person and they were all touring guys. Well, when the touring situation stopped, Unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, the, the, no money for touring, no money for lessons. So it made me have to really reassess like how I'm doing things. So I'm uh, the YouTube thing. I just signed up for Facebook again. Um, so I'm doing like the Patreon thing as well. I'm really having to come up with unique ways in order to continue reaching people. You know, um, I'm hoping if all goes well, I'll be able to start doing some clinics after um, it's safe. And, you know, uh, I've been reached out to by several people asking questions, not just about um, music, but just about like ways of uh, being a musician in, in this like day and age. Um, I, I had two one-on-one um, -on -one Instagram calls with uh, two guys from the UK a couple of days ago. One guy was going to a university in London. The other kid was 14. And he was like, how do I make money doing gigs? And uh, we talked for like an hour and some change. And he was, he could not have been nicer. He was very sweet. And uh, we, we came up with a strategy about how him and his band can start gigging and making money at the local pub. So 
I, I realized about four or five years ago that more than touring, more than like playing in front of shows, and I love doing shows, don't get me wrong. What I really love is inspiring other people to realize they can do it. Um, and I remember the first time I saw Steve Jordan uh, on video, I realized you didn't necessarily have to have crazy Thomas Lang chops. Thomas Lang is a monster. Actually, I met him one day when I was street performing. He was super nice. Um, I said, you want to play? He's like, no, that's cool. <laughs> Um, but yeah, he was very nice. Shout out to you, Thomas. You're great. Um, but I realized that, uh, you don't have to have Thomas Lang chops. You know, you don't have to be like Mike Mangini or Vinny or Dave, no disrespect to any of those guys, but like, you don't necessarily have to possess those things to have a gig. Now, if you want to play with dream theater, you do, but, um, if you're just playing, you know, in your local bar, play the song, play the grooves, you know, I mean, every Beatles record you hear is one of like 10 grooves, right? Um, no disrespect to Ringo. It's just like, it's not reinventing the wheel, playing basic stuff. Now, what is difficult is listening, having big ears when you're listening, um, having solid time. That's super important. Um, also being able to play dynamically. That's very important. Also showing up on time, being sober, right? Um, not being a butthead. Uh, you know, like it's, it's other stuff like that, that I, I want to make sure that if I can do anything to help out, to show other people, what not to do? Because believe me, I've screwed the pooch a lot. Um, I then I would I would I would be honored to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, you know, like so I realized like I wanted to be able to do that, and I was discussing my vision for like how I wanted to teach and how I wanted to approach it with another drum teacher. And he's like, it, he said, it says, he said it sounds sorry, I get excited sometimes. He said it sounds a lot more like coaching than teaching. And I was like, yeah, I mean, because I don't want it to be just like, all right, and when you leave, it's done. I want it to be like, and they can text me also, you know, because so like several of my students have asked me about like pay, you know, and I'll be, I'll, I'm honest with people about like pay and like what it, it can be amazing, can be crappy. I did a TV show one time, I made like 700 bucks for five minutes. Eee. I've done gigs where I played for four and a half hours and I made $40. Like it's not consistent at all. If you have an amazing gig, hold on to it. If you enjoy it, but if not, then there's nothing wrong with, you know, dipping out and going, driving for Uber. I mean, you know, the thing is, it's like in this day and age where so much of what we do, we take for granted. And uh, so much of what is happening right now is, you know, it, it's stopping us from being able to have a livelihood. I know several musicians that are probably going to lose their homes. Um, and it's, it's it really is messed up because we've been told we don't matter. Like we don't have value when in reality, like music and what it does for people's hearts it influences people and it gets them out of funk, uh, out of, out of a funk, sometimes with the funk. Um, but it's like, when you think of like all the amazing music that came out of horrific times, World War II, heavy music, Korea, Vietnam. I mean, then you have hair metal and that was a thing. Um, but you know, out of adversity, out of turmoil, usually comes some of the best music. So, I mean, I would be surprised if, um, if some phenomenal songs aren't being written right now, unfortunately, people aren't buying records. Uh, musicians aren't able to showcase what they're doing unless it's online. So a lot of people are having to now double down and do this, you know, getting an iRig or getting some kind of situation where they can stream or play for tips or, or whatever. So now it's like virtual street performing. <laughs> a little bit more classy, though, I think. But um, I think more people are going to have to really reassess why they're in this for the first place. You know, are they in it for the money? You might want to get out if you're in it just for the money. Um, are you in it because you love it? That's the real question you got to be asking yourself. I'm in this because I love it. Um, not just um, playing, but like I said, the, the teaching, hopefully inspiring others to pursue their dreams and being able to share my experiences and, and tell you what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing, how important your mindset is, right? Perception is huge, obviously. Everyone's wanting to look good for the gram. Um, but at the same time, you know, you want to be able to, be real and be honest because, you know, they're going to see through that. They're going to see through that real freaking quick. And for me, when I really, oh, there you go, David. oh, bro, dude, thank you so much, man. Um, thank you, David. I appreciate that. Um, what, when, when I realized for me is like, I, I got to just be myself. I got to stop being who I think people, um, who I think people want me to be. Right. Um, and 
I decided that I wanted to be who I wish I had access to as a kid. Cause I didn't, I didn't have the ability to like email a lot of people, you know, back in the day, like you had a hope they had a working email address and then you had hope they actually checked it, you know, whereas now it's like somebody could message me from the middle East, which happens a lot. Um, and say like, Hey, what's this snare? What do you think about this groove? Check out my band. And I do, you know, cause I, I dig that. Cause I mean, at the end of the day, the music industry is upside down right now. And if we're not reinvested into each other, then what are we freaking doing? Right. So, all right. Do we have any more questions? I don't know. Jules, do we have any more questions? I guess I'll keep talking. <laughs> nope. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, guys. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk with you guys about before I end this whole thing is what have you guys been up to? I mean, you know, like what have you been doing during this downtime? I know several of you who uh, haven't had access to a drum kit. And my honestly, my heart goes out to you because that sounds awful. Um, I, I don't take it for granted at all that I have a home studio space. I'm able to practice that. It's my basement. It can get sort of loud, but not too loud where it bugs my family in order. And, you know, they, they kick me out. It's not that bad. But, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, uh, have you been reading? Have you taking online classes, you know, I mean, it's, it's like, what, what gives you joy during this time? I know a lot of people are writing music. Um, a lot of people are learning how to record themselves. A lot of people are doing photography and, and all that kind of, uh, all that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, it's just whatever helps you get through, you know, but, um, yeah, this was a lot of fun, Jules. I really enjoyed doing this thing. This was cool. Um, <laughs> hopefully you guys all dug it. Um, I know I get on tangents and I rant a little bit, but, um, Seriously, I, I, I have nothing but the utmost respect for all of you out there doing it. Um, if you guys are interested in, in checking me out, my YouTube page is Nashville uh, Drum Coach, YouTube slash Nashville Drum Coach. My Instagram is Instagram slash Nashville Drum Coach. My YouTube, or excuse me, my, my Facebook, which I just signed up for, Facebook.com slash Nashville Drum Coach. Um, message me. Feel free to reach out for anything, whether it's, you know, you want to chat, you want a lesson, you want to hire me for a session, whatever. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear from you guys, you know, what you guys are up to. Um, if you see anything cool that you think I'd be into, hit me up because I'm, I'm down to check that out too. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been an amazing journey. Um, just, just this whole thing. Uh, and I'm, I don't take for granted at all what I've been allowed to be able to do with you guys today. Um, so thank you, Jules. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, everybody at LP. Um, uh, and also, there's some really cool, exciting things coming up on August 13th at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, Ray Islas, he is a phenomenal percussion player, and he's going to be doing another one of these things. And I'm really excited about that. And um, also, if you want to check out more of this stuff like that, you can go to dwdrums.com slash drum network. And um, yeah, they got all kinds of goodies coming up. Jules was really kind to share with me some of those things that they have. And I'm very excited to see all this stuff. I know a lot of you are needing some uh, entertainment and uh, it's free. So what are you going to do? You know, but uh, there's some phenomenal drummers coming up and uh, hopefully it'll do nothing but inspire you guys to be better people, not just musicians, but better people. So Jules, I think I'm going to sign off. Thank you guys so much for letting me do this. And, uh, we will talk soon. All right. Bye.